to patiently wait. This is the theme for this hour, and the hymn expressed it quite nicely, that if we don't understand here, let us wait until then. In the meantime, while we wait, we want to understand what the Lord is doing among us so that we can patiently wait. The messages of the past few Sabbaths have focused on the quickening of the Holy Spirit upon our sinful flesh, our sin-sick flesh. We had been reading Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, that as Jesus was quickened, was made alive, let's read there again, Romans 8, to let these words resonate in our understanding. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. It is the Spirit of God that quickened and raised the body of Christ, which we read in 2 Peter 3, verse 18 and 19 as well. How that it was the Spirit by which he preached to the people in Noah's time that gave him life when he rose. And it is the consciousness of Jesus and his reliance upon God, upon the Holy Spirit, that quickens us as we believe. Uh, those beautiful words that we quoted from Psalms 16, verses 8 to 10, those precious words of Jesus that <coughs> were the source of his definite faith, no matter what he experienced. He said here in verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my joy, my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Did you notice that this scripture tells us that Jesus set the Lord always before him? And this is the call for each one of us to set the Lord always before us to be conscious by our choice of his presence. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And therefore, because of that presence, because of that fullness of joy, Jesus could enter the future that he described to the disciples as they were making their way to Jerusalem, which we studied this morning, that he could tell them what was going to happen to him and he could go forward rejoicing because my flesh was resting in hope that the Lord would help me through that terrible plight. It is this quickening in us that we have been reading and I have hinted time and time again through the messages along this line that this 
experience of dying with Jesus so that the, the quickening power of the Holy Spirit would take place is a ongoing, repeated daily experience where the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. And Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. And this is what we have quoted in the, in the previous messages in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> that this ongoing repetition is the quickening source of our life. That's 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 and 11, where it says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Always bearing in the body the death. Always. So that always the quickening power of the Holy Spirit will be manifested. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. You see, that body is mortal. And that mortal flesh must be quickened repeatedly. Otherwise it would deteriorate into a hopeless, diseased condition. It is only by the death and resurrection of Jesus that we have life now that we have the energies that are needed. It is only because of him. And in this process of daily dying and daily continually receiving the life, the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, the Christian perfection takes place. Daily dying, daily being quickened, until finally there is a victory at the end, a harvest. It is a process that is depicted in nature. You see it when the butterfly lays an egg. That egg finally bursts and up comes a little baby caterpillar, very small. And then it's eating ferociously. And that caterpillar grows and grows until finally it becomes a big, juicy, fat caterpillar. And then what happens? It goes into a chrysalis, and by the process of metamorphosis, the painful experience, when you watch it, if you wanted to save the, that chrysalis from suffering, you'll kill it. You've got to let it actually try to wriggle out of that chrysalis, when it finally comes out with its wings all crushed and so on, it finally sits there and dries and then comes this beautiful butterfly. This is the experience of God's people as they go through the process of death and resurrection with Jesus. Jesus' own words describe this in another lesson of nature in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, reading there from verses 26 to 28. Mark 4, 26 to 28. <clears throat> and he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and he should sleep and rise, night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. But how? First the blade, then the ear, 
after that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. The harvest is the end of the world. And the people of God go through the process of germination in the spiritual realm. First the blade, then it grows and comes up with the ear and after that the full corn in the ear. And then comes the harvest when people have developed into fruit-bearing of that nature. In, Colossian, uh, rather in Christ Object Lessons, page 65, we let the spirit of prophecy elaborate for us this beautiful uh, picture of process of dying and rising by the quickening power of the Holy Spirit as described by Jesus. In paragraph 2, the germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life. The germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life. And the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace, there can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As, it growth, as its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. Did you pick that up? As its growth is silent and imperceptible. Can you see the plant growing? You can't. It's imperceptible that it's growing. But it grows continuously. And that is the development of the Christian life. Imperceptible. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. We shall become strong to bear responsibility and our maturity will be in proportion to our privileges. The object lesson that Jesus laid out there is beautiful as well as the metamorphosis of a butterfly. But you see here that there is a, uh, a very important element in this development, and that is the farmer has to wait patiently for the harvest. That is denoted there, to wait patiently. The work of the Holy Spirit is something that is repeated all through the life to produce a final product of pure character. If we, if we turn here to Romans chapter 8, here it spells it out very distinctly that our salvation is the same as the hopeful and wistful watching of a farmer to see his crop coming to harvest time. Romans chapter 8, verses 8, 19 to 26. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same 
in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Are you picking up this, this hope of something that is not yet seen? We are saved by hope. Like the creatures, there is a groaning within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Wasn't our body rejuvenated by the Holy Spirit? Of course, but it's not a final rejuvenation. There is a redemption of our body that is to take place at the very end. In the meantime... The work of the Holy Spirit, as it says, helpeth our infirmities. We are saved by hope for that to take place. If you see something, do you have to hope for it? When the harvest is there, does the farmer have to hope for it? No, he can immediately go in and, and harvest. But until it happens, he has to go through the winter and be anxious about frost. They might just kill the crop. Or the canker worm, or all these things. There is a waiting, a hoping for the harvest, harvest to come. And so it is in the Christian walk. We are saved by hope. And we are called upon to patiently wait for it. Jesus expressed that very thing in Psalms 40. Psalms 40 verse 1. He couldn't see. He was hoping. <clears throat> His flesh rested in hope, in dependence on the Father and the Holy Spirit. And as he was there, hanging upon the cross, dying, he could not see through the portals of the tomb, we are told. He relied upon his dependence of, on, on the Father. He said, I waited, how? Patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. As we watch Jesus in the pit of this earth, before the cross even, he was suffering. He was suffering the, the terrible experiences of the sinful flesh that he was bearing, and he was agonizing and pleading with God to conquer this and to continue to persevere through to the end, and he did. And it was the Father, the Lord, who brought him out of that horrible pit. Patient waiting. As we set the Lord always before us, that's the call. I set the Lord always before me. 
in close communion of the Holy Spirit. It is that repetitious depending upon the Spirit is that His movement upon us will bring forth. How will it bring forth? We often wait for something to happen quickly. And this has been something that I had struggled with as I came through the experience from the Adventist Church to the Reform and finally into the ministry until I understood. I was waiting for the new birth by magic. I was waiting for something special to happen and now I live happily ever after. And it never happened. The Holy Spirit quickens our mortal flesh, but not abruptly. Rather, according to Proverbs 4, verse 18. Proverbs 4, <coughs> verse 18. where it talks about the people who have been born again, who have been justified, their path. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The path of God's people who are being energized whose flesh is being uh, quickened <coughs> by the Holy Spirit because we set him ever before us. As their life is being quickened, the work, the consistent work of the Holy Spirit quickening, giving life, letting it grow, causing it to grow like the plants. There is a constant work of God working in, those, in that crop all day, every day. So it is with us in the Holy Spirit in us as we set him before us. We, said it, we read it there in Christ Object Lessons imperceptibly. Here it is again from Review and Herald, April 28, 1891. Imperceptibly, to ourselves, we are to be changed day by day from our evil ways and will. Now mark how this is written. We will be changed imperceptibly from our evil ways and will into the ways and will of Christ, into the loveliness of his character, Thus, we grow up into him and unconsciously reflect his image. The work of the Holy Spirit is the work of changing my evil ways and my evil will into the ways and will of Christ. And that work is not abrupt in Bible commentary volume 2 page 1016 paragraph 8 it repeats this thought under the influence of divine grace every good quality would be gaining strength while evil traits would as steadily lose their power this is the work which the Lord proposes to do for all who consecrate themselves to him. Have you consecrated yourself to God? That's the work. Patiently waiting. Waiting in reference to what? The changes from our evil ways into... The and will into the ways and will of Christ. Gain the influence of divine grace, every quality, the will of God, the character of Jesus, would be gaining strength, while 
evil traits would as steadily lose their power. What is this saying to us in all simple English? The Holy Spirit does not remove all your evil at once. So as we continue to fellowship together, will we see evil in the church? Absolutely. Will I see evil in you? Will you see evil in me? Absolutely. Because the Lord is changing us from our own evil ways, gaining good qualities, gaining strength, while evil traits simultaneously losing their power. Isn't that an encouragement? That when we see things that are not perfect in each other, we don't have to get distressed, thinking, that person's lost. No, they're not. They consecrate their lives to Jesus, and they want to follow him. And while they are still got some evil traits there, those evil traits under the quickening power of the Holy Spirit will systematically lose their power while the good traits will systematically increase and grow. The growth of the plant will take place while the evil parts will drop off. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The quickening action of the Holy Spirit is progressive whether it be spiritually or physically let's go back to Romans where we were reading all the time Romans 8 it's a long uh, um, a long um, chapter where the apostle Paul deals quite widely with this subject there in Romans 8, again, reading there from verse 29 to 30. And he that searcheth the hearts. Sorry, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. And God knows ahead of time the people who make their decision for him. He knows it ahead of time. Him he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So here you can see the progressive work. Them that he predestinated, he knew that they would make the right choice. He knows before time. And as he knows this, he is able to predestine them to grow. It's not a very hard subject to understand. A grain of wheat is predestined, isn't it? A grain of wheat is predestined to grow if these circumstances are correct. We know it's going to grow into, into a, a crop. God knows the people he's looking at. Who is the one who is at wheat and who is a tear? He knows it in seed already. And those people that are wheat, he predestinates by calling them, that's very much like the grain coming up as a, as, a, uh, as a little blade. The call of nature is calling, the call of the Holy Spirit is bringing forth the blade. Then having been called, to them he called them, he also justified. He declared them as just with, because they take hold of Jesus and Christ's righteousness is declared upon them. And whom he justified, them he also glorified who does that 
Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Here is the glorifying. It's another word for sanctification. Verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as what? By the Spirit of of the Lord. It is a progressive exercise of the Spirit. Whether it be in regards to our physical needs or whether it be in regards to our spiritual needs. The Holy Spirit is at work to restore the character and the physical condition of the body as we set him before us. Those beautiful quotes are coupled with that statement in Psalm 103 that we have been reading. Let's go there, verses 2 to 4. <clears throat> in regards to our sin that he is purifying and regards to our health. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. It says... Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. What does he do? He forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Say, so does this read, he has forgiven and he has healed? It's not how it's reading, is it? What does that mean? He is in the process of doing it. He is forgiving. He is healing all our diseases. The beautiful scripture of Exodus 15, which is very dear to me because I have seen it in action. Exodus 15 was the promise I laid before God when my daughter suffered osteomyelitis. And here was the promise. He said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for what? For I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Does he do it abruptly? It's a process. Like with our sinful state, it's precisely the same work. And it's very interesting that what you're reading here has to do with getting rid of sin and getting rid of disease. How does it say? If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments. Is that to do with overcoming sin? Then if you will do that and keep all his statutes, then I will put none of the diseases upon me which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Can you see the coupling here, the conjunction with doing that which is right and God's healing. God is working in us to overcome sin, which is the breaking of the commandments of God. And as the evil traits will be decreasing, the good traits will be increasing. And as we are learning that, the healing takes place co-jointly.
if it was anything different, if it was what people think it want, it is, in these times of quick fixes, if it was like that, I want to read to you from Testimony, Volume 4, <clears throat> page 429. Testimony 4, page 429. There in paragraph 2, it says this. Testimony, Volume 4. Page 429. It says there, <clears throat> Precious, precious probationary time is given to be improved in washing our robes of character and making them white in the blood of the Lamb. The evil traits have to be washed out, bit by bit. To remove the stains of sin requires the work of a lifetime. Every day, renewed efforts in retraining and denying self are needed, Every day there are new battles to fight and victories to be gained. Every day the soul shall be called out in earnest pleading with God for the mighty victories of the cross. Every day. Precious probationary time is given for this. That's how good increases and evil decreases. And desiring a quick fix in these modern times of false miracle, I repeat, false miracles. The medical profession has done miracles. But do those miracles heal us? They might prolong life, but they do not heal us. It is the Lord that healeth us. And here again, there is call for patience in reference to the spiritual progress and the healing progress. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Here we see this how of patience in regards to the work of even our healing. Romans chapter 5. Reading there, verses 3 to 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience works experience. And experience, what? Hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. By whom? By the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So we go through the process of growth by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. I will set the Lord always before me. And as we do that, we go through tribulations. Why? For that patience to develop, for experience to develop and for hope to come into existence. And when hope is there, it maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad there by the Holy Spirit. And we come to James 1, 
beautifully re-expressed there in some bright, more dimension. James 1, verses 2 to 4. James 1, 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We believe in righteousness by faith that we will one day stand entire, without sin. How will that take place? Through tribulation. That tribulation works upon us. Tribulation has many different forms, whether it be sickness, whether it be um, uh, persecution, whether it be uh, church problems, uh, whatever they are. They are all working to achieve something, to achieve patience, which leads to hope, which leads to perfection. So God takes us through tribulations to develop our recovery. Notice, when it comes to praying for healing, if we were to be healed immediately, when we have been asking for the Lord to heal me straight away, if that was to happen, notice in Review and Herald, June 9, 1891. God does not always answer our prayers the first time we call upon him. For should he do this, what would happen? Because remember, our evil traits are not yet all gone. And if our evil traits are not yet all gone, what would happen if he would heal us immediately? It says, Should he do this, we might take it for granted, that we had a right to all the blessings and favours he bestows upon us. Instead of searching our hearts to see if any evil was entertained by us, any sin indulged, we would become careless and fail to realise our dependence upon him and our need of his help. Can you see? The Lord doesn't heal Abruptly. The Lord teaches us how to learn to wait patiently and to see the development of his mercy while we keep on crying. Lord, help me. I'm in desperate need. Please help me. And then as he helps us, he's answering our prayers, but we are learning. We are making experience that comes and leads us to patience. And here is a very powerful quote from Councils on Health, which really throws the picture perfectly in our understanding. Councils on Health, reading there, page 379, paragraph 2. You see, it is a characteristic in us with our evil traits that still need cleaning that they would carry us away into carelessness. Here it is now, page 379, paragraph 2. It says this. We are so weak that we cannot bear much spiritual prosperity lest we take the glory and accredit goodness and righteousness to ourselves as the reason of the signal blessing of God, when it was all because of the great mercy and loving kindness of our compassionate Heavenly Father, and not because any good was found in us. I've got such faith that the Lord can heal me and if he heals me straight away, then I'm full of myself. Look at that. I have such faith and look how he has healed me. 
But when we are in this weak, sinful condition, the Lord has to work very, very patiently with us to let us suffer and realize that while we're crying to Him, it is only by His mercy that we are being helped because we are sinners. And we learn, make experience through the process of the steady healing recovering work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, it is the meek he will come to save. And hence, this subject. It is while we wait, and we wait, and we wait, that we are learning to become meek. Unless we become so impatient that our love will grow cold. And that's what Jesus said. Uh, because iniquity abounds, the love of many grows cold. Our love for God must not grow cold because he is trying to develop a character that is like Jesus, meek, lowly. A meek person will patiently bear Anything that's happening to him. Is that right? Mm -hmm. If I'm not meek, I will become frustrated and annoyed with the slow process that is taking place in my life. But the Lord is trying to remove that impatience. The Lord is trying to create meekness, patience. The meek will be patiently bearing Humbly, the tribulations befalling them. They will be patient with the failures of themselves and with the failures of each other. Is that right? If we are meek, will we become annoyed because the other person isn't perfect yet? And so many times we become frustrated because things aren't perfect in the church. <coughs> Sister White writes, in this day with God, we must be bear with the peculiarities of those around us. That's on page 262, paragraph 5. We must bear with the peculiarities of those around us around us. And in Manuscript Releases, page 181, we read the following in paragraph 4. <coughs> 181. And there in paragraph 4. The converting power of God needs to come upon men who deal with sacred things. Is that what we're doing as a church? Dealing with sacred things? God has borne long with our individual perversities and has not given us up to our own way to be filled with the fruit of our own doings. that right how patient he has been with us and we should learn to be patient with the perversities and errors of others we shall reveal what is in our hearts by the words we speak the connection between the heart and the words of our mouth is very intimate and by our words we shall be individually judged in the last day. If my heart is not meek, how will I behave towards my brethren and sisters? Will I speak words of frustration? Because 
the heart and the words are closely, very intimately bound. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so, because the, we understand from this subject that the work of the Holy Spirit is not an abrupt work, because every one of us is being led along through the processes of tribulation to reveal to us the cankers in our soul, the character defects, to let them become purified by the work of the Holy Spirit, to conquer the mortal flesh, the sinful flesh, because we know that. We will be patient. We will wait patiently for each other. This was a caption that I saw many years ago on the back windscreen of a car. And I thought, wow. It said, Please bear patiently with me. God is not finished with me yet. Precious words. Please bear patiently with me. God is not finished with me yet. And as we go back to our scripture reading in Lamentations 3, we can see how real that is in summary of what we have been meditating here. Lamentations chapter 3. Reading there from verse 22 to 26, then 31 to 35 and 39 to 41. <clears throat> it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. Why are we not consumed? We are sinners. It's because of his mercies. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Remember, I have put the Lord always before me. He's my portion. Therefore will I hope in him. My flesh resteth in hope. Yes. The Lord is good unto them that wait. What? That wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Verse 31. The Lord will not cast off forever. Didn't Jesus feel cast off? My God, where are you? But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, Verse 39, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands unto God in the heavens. Precious words. They are for us to read again and again as we contemplate the material that we have been meditating here just now. So indeed, for us to come through this period of time of earth's history, the Lord is preparing a people to live a pure and holy life through tribulations, through hardships. He is at work to cleanse us from all sin, to remove all evil in the process of time until he has a people that are without fault. And what are they characterized by? Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let us be willing to be among that people.
patiently wait. Amen.